So good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you on this afternoon as we celebrate the compilation of a scholarly piece on the work of Eva Fleischner. The memory of goodness, Eva Fleischner and her contributions to Holocaust studies, edited by Carol Rittner and John K. Roth. It's extraordinary that we have with us today Carol Rittner, who will offer remarks and sign copies of the memory of goodness. The memory of goodness pays tribute to Eva, a dedicated Catholic who became a remarkable, pioneering Holocaust scholar and educator. She was a longtime member of the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education Advisory Board and a friend of Seton Hill. The funding for this wonderful project was made possible thanks to an extraordinary leadership commitment from the late Hans and Leslie Fleischner, the brother and sister-in-law of Eva. In addition to this scholarly publication, their generosity is enabling Seton Hill to continue and expand the university's efforts around Holocaust education and to combat disinformation and the polarization of our society through the Eva Fleschner Truth Finding Program. It's a privilege to have with us this evening Hans and Leslie's son and Eva's nephew, Chris Fleischner and his wife, Dawn. Welcome, Chris and Dawn. The memory, the memory of Goodness contains probing essays by Eva. Gathered from the diverse books and journals in which they originally appeared, Eva's writings focus on teaching, rescue, and responsibility, and Jewish-Christian relations, the fields in which she made her most important contributions to Holocaust studies. They reveal Eva's fierce and unrelenting determination to affirm the inclusive religious pluralism that flourishing post-Holocaust respect between Christians and Jews. The Memory of Goodness was edited by Holocaust scholars Carol Rittner and John K. Roth, who have published many books together, including most recently, Advancing Holocaust Studies. Dr. Rittner is a member of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, is Distinguished Professor Emerita of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and Dr. Marsha Radikoff Grossman, Professor Emerita of Holocaust Studies at Stockton University. Sister Carol is an academic and activist, a liaison to the United Nations, and an Academy Award-nominated filmmaker. Carol has dedicated her life to her Christian faith and to understanding the circumstances that allowed the Holocaust to occur. She's authored, authored a number of books that explore the Holocaust, its causes, and how people responded to the tragedy. She has also examined the relationship between the Holocaust and the Christian world and how religion played a part in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Her film, The Courage to Care, was nominated for a 1986 Academy Award in the short documentary category. Carol, we are grateful for the work you and John K. Roth have done to continue to advance Ava Fleschner's legacy. We're honored to be able to present Ava's work in a comprehensive form through the publication of The Memory of Goodness, and we hope that her words will serve as a reminder to people today and in the future of the deadly toll that disinformation and hatred takes on humankind. We will now have remarks for Carol, uh, from Carol Reitner, Chris Fleschner, and Deborah Fraser McMahon. Carol, please come to the podium. Thanks very much for that very generous um, introduction. Before I begin my comments, I'd like to just recall for us that today, April 6th, 2022, is the anniversary of the beginning of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. And um, unfortunately, Rwanda was not the last genocide. And while I'm a little reluctant to call what's happening in Ukraine horrible as it is, genocide, it is certainly a mass atrocity crime. So we need to keep in mind, I think, even as uh, I speak about Eva and um, her work, 
And what her work makes me think about, uh, we should keep in mind these other victims as well. So first, thank you for the opportunity to launch our new book, The Memory of Goodness, Eva Fleischner and Her Contributions to Holocaust Studies here at Seton Hill University. And when I say our new book, I include John K. Roth, my co-editor, in that hour, as well as Dr. Jim Paharik, the director of the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education, his close associate at the center, Hannah uh, Shioko, and the late Hans Fleischner and his wife, Leslie, the brother and sister-in-law of Dr. Eva Fleischner. Yes, John and I selected the essays. We lightly edited them for clarity, accuracy, and consistency. And we introduced the various parts of the memory of goodness. But without the cooperation and support of the people I just mentioned, I doubt this book would have been published. So I want to say thank you to everyone. John and I believe that Eva's essays remain as relevant today as they were 15, 20, even 30 and more years ago. The memory of goodness begins with John Roth's powerful prologue entitled, The Way She Lived. It is an eloquent and elegant introduction to the life and work of Eva Fleischner. It is also an introduction to the three parts of the book, teaching, rescue and responsibility, and Jewish-Christian relations. These were issues about which Eva was concerned, issues she researched and wrote about, issues that were important to her over the years. As those of us who admired and worked with Eva knew, she was an honest woman. Truth-telling was fundamental for her. She thought deeply about why she did the work that was hers. She was not afraid to confront the long history of the teaching of contempt toward Jews and Judaism that can be found in Christian theology, liturgy, and preaching. Nor was she afraid to explore Christianity's complicity in the Holocaust, the indifference and apathy of too many Christians, particularly Roman Catholic Christians during the Holocaust. She taught her students at Montclair State College in New Jersey and at Marquette University in Milwaukee about these deeply troubling issues because she wanted to save her students from ignorance, blindness, and apathy, which she said is perhaps the greatest sin of our age. I think that is also why Eva involved herself in research and teaching about rescue during the Holocaust, not just to honor those who helped Jews during the Holocaust, but to try to save her students from indifference to the suffering of others. As the late Elie Wiesel used to say, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Indifference is an attitude that basically say, says what is happening to those people, whoever those people might be, has nothing to do with me or mine, or us. They are not my business. I have other people and things to worry about. During the Nazi era, World War II and the Holocaust, those people were Jews in Germany and elsewhere in German-occupied Europe. They did concern Eva. She wanted to know why some people tried to help those people and why others did not. Eva's essay, Can the Few Become the Menti, 
Can the Few Become the Many, focuses on French Catholics, especially women in German-occupied France who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. It is both a title and a question. Can the few become the many? Can more people become like those models of decency and courage she interviewed in her research, then taught about to her students? I think Eva wanted her students to recognize that those French women, and men too, were perfectly ordinary people like themselves, like us, and that we should not think of people who helped Jews during the Holocaust as heroes or saints, not only because they themselves refused this label, but because it would let, let us off the hook too easily. Eva did not want her students does not want us to view the, these rescuers as heroes beyond our reach. Doing so runs the risk of making us passive admirers, bystanders, as it were. Eva taught about these French rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust to remind her students, to remind us about what so many others could have done, but what so many others did not do and to challenge her students, to challenge us, to think about how they and we want to live our lives in relationship to others. Of course, John and I did not know, nor could we know, all the events, experiences, people, or documents that influenced Eva in her human, scholarly, and spiritual development, but we think based on what she has written and what it reveals about where she focused her interest, the chronology we developed provides a context for understanding this pioneering teacher-scholar who contributed so much to the development of Holocaust studies and to furthering Jewish-Christian relations. Our chronology begins with Eva's birth on July 7, 1925, and ends with the month of December 2021, a few weeks before The Memory of Goodness was published. In addition to the chronology and the essays in our book, John and I included four documents in the appendix. The first, Nostra Aetate, Vatican II's 1965 document on the Catholic Church's relationship with non-Christian religions contains the all-important paragraph number four, repudiating anti-Semitism and disavowing the deicide charge that Jews are collectively guilty for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The second document, The Vatican and the Holocaust, a preliminary report, was issued in October 2000 by the International Catholic Jewish Historical Commission. Eva was a member of that commission, but not a happy member. She resigned in December 2000, seven months before the commission itself disbanded amidst controversy with the Vatican because the commission members could not gain access to Vatican archival holdings they felt were necessary for their, for their research about the Holy See and Pius XII during the Holocaust. One could teach an entire course on the Vatican, Pius XII, and the Holocaust using the many questions the commission identified and that they wanted to pursue, but no luck as there was no openness on the part of the Vatican officials to allowing them access to the archives. Hopefully, now that Pope Francis has opened the Vatican archive from that era to scholars, we shall get some answers to the questions they asked. The last two documents we included in the book are Dabru Emmet, a Jewish statement on Christians and Christianity, issued 
in September 2000 by a group of interdenominational Jewish representatives of the Jewish Scholars Project hosted by the Institute for Christian and Jewish Studies in Baltimore. And the last document, A Sacred Obligation, Rethinking Christian Faith in Relation to Judaism and the Jewish People, issued in September 2002 by the Christian Scholars Group on Christian-Jewish Relations in Response to Dabru Emmet, is the fourth document that we listed in our book. Eva was one of the signatories of a sacred obligation. These four documents highlight Eva's enduring concerns and commitments to Jews, Judaism, and Holocaust studies. The Memory of Goodness also has an extensive bibliography of Eva's published work. John and I compiled the bibliography from the numerous books and journals to which she contributed over the course of her career as a scholar and teacher of Holocaust studies and as a scholar, teacher, and advocate for better understanding between Christians and Jews after the Holocaust. I mentioned a moment ago that John Roth and I believe that Eva's essays remain as relevant today as they were 15, 20, even 30 and more years ago. Topics such as challenges involved in teaching about the Holocaust, Pope Pius XII during the Holocaust, forgiveness after the Holocaust, and Abraham Joshua Heschel's significance for Jewish-Christian relations are still important issues today. But I would like to speak for a few minutes about one that drew Eva's ongoing attention years ago and I believe still requires ours today. The teaching of contempt about Jews and Judaism that even today still casts a shadow over how we Christians how we Christians hear the Christian scriptures, particularly during Lent and Holy Week and in the weeks following Easter. Yes, I know there have been numerous documents on the correct way to present Jews and Judaism in Catholic teaching and preaching issued by popes, the Vatican, and by various national conferences of Catholic bishops since Vatican II and Nostra Aetate in 1965. I know that after Vatican II, we Catholic Christians have edited our textbooks and religious education texts, even our prayers for the Good Friday liturgy, removing negative images and words about Jews and Judaism. Yes, I know that after Vatican II, popes and bishops have spoken out and condemned anti-Semitism wherever and whenever it has reared its ugly head. And yes, I know that seminaries and theological schools have tried to educate priests and lay people about Jews and Judaism in such a way as to be more sensitive about Jews and Judaism in their preaching and teaching. And yet, yes and yet, the words we Roman Catholic Christians hear read from the Christian scriptures during Lent, Holy Week, and the weeks after Easter do not encourage the Christian faithful to have a positive view of Jews and Judaism. What we Roman Catholics have not done is remove or even modify the traditional translation of the Greek term hoi adenai, the Jews, that we hear over and over again in the readings at Mass, during Lent, Holy Week, and in the weeks after Easter. And this, despite all the documents and statements issued by the Vatican, the Pope, and his army of cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops, and bishops 
Despite all the efforts we Roman Catholics have made to cleanse our religious textbooks and prayers of any hint of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, I know that the Greek phrase hoi adonai, generally translated as the Jews, can be used as a neutral term, in a neutral sense, as when a group of people are being presented as a distinct religious or cultural entity without any negative evaluation. But hoi I deny, the Jews, can also be used in a general way and out of context and with little or no explanation. Used in such a way, it is the source of the deicide accusation that brought so much pain through the centuries and is ever present in passion plays like the Omer, Omer, Omergau passion play in Germany. The term hoi adonai, the Jews, is found 87 times in the four gospels. Of course, a short explanation would help the listener understand that the term hoi adonai, the Jews, does not cover the whole Jewish community, but perhaps refers to a specific group that was in opposition to Jesus' mes message. I would venture to say that way beyond few are the Catholic parishes, and way beyond rare are the priests, deacons, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, patriarchs, even popes, who year after year remind the faithful during Lent, Holy Week, and the weeks after Easter that hoi oi denai, translated as the Jews, did not and does not mean all the Jews living at the time of Jesus or the Jews today. I believe that when people at Mass hear the sacred scriptures proclaimed, hear the words, the Jews, pronounced by the deacon or the celebrant, as they will tomorrow, Thursday, when the Gospel of John chapter 8 is read at Mass, and on Friday of this week, when they again hear the, the Gospel of John chapter 10 proclaimed, and when they hear the Gospel of John chapter 18 and 19 read in this year's Good Friday liturgy, and on the second Sunday of Easter, the so-called Divine Mercy Sunday, and when people at Mass hear these words from chapter 20 of the Gospel, according to John, these words, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, end of quote, I doubt many will be making the distinction between a neutral use of the term the Jews, and a negative use of the phrase. I think what people will hear are the words, the Jews, and I think they will be reminded how unfortunate the Jews, they personally know, as well as the Jews they have never met, are when it comes to attaining, as the Good Friday prayer states, the fullness of redemption. Elie Wiesel often said, words matter. Take care with words. Words can kill. I think the words, the Jews, we proclaim and hear in the Christian scriptures do damage when they say or imply the Jews are in opposition to Jesus and his teachings. When the words of the scriptures say or imply the Jews are responsible for handing Jesus over for crucifixion. And when they say or imply that the disciples were behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. No matter how many times biblical scholars tell us that the Bible is not a book of facts, but of faith. That the Bible is not a history text, but a faith text. The words people hear proclaimed in churches, 
Catholic, Protestant, and Christian Orthodox alike, have an effect on those who hear them year after year, Lent after Lent, Holy Week after Holy Week, the weeks of Easter after the weeks of Easter. Words like crucify him, crucify him. Peter's, uh, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. That's John chapter 18. Such words have an effect, and I think the effect of these words, proclaimed as the word of God, does damage to our attitudes towards and our relationship with Jews today. No matter how much we protest, they do not. I am not a scripture scholar, and I do not claim to be. But when I read the essays of Eva Fleischner, particularly those in which she writes about the teaching of contempt about Jews and Judaism in Christian theology, when I reflect on what she has to say about this teaching of contempt, when I think about Elie Wiesel's reminder that words matter, that the words we use matter, I am compelled to think about the words of the Christian scriptures I hear, especially during this liturgical season and in the weeks after Easter. We Christians, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox alike, mu must do something to remedy the effects of the words from our Christian scriptures that we hear and that sound anti-Jewish, even if we say we do not intend them to be anti-Jewish. And we must do so while maintaining the meaning and intent of the original Greek texts. Perhaps this is an area where the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education can help. We Christians, especially those of us who teach and preach, those of us who prepare and proclaim the readings at Mass on weekdays and Sundays, could use some remedial help, some reminders that words matter, that we need to be sensitive and pastoral about how we lift the words of the Christian scriptures into the 21st century. Perhaps the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education can find ways to once again educate priests and pastors, nuns and lay men and women, teachers, seminarians and students who proclaim the Christian scriptures at daily mass and on Sundays, so they will be encouraged to use words like the temple leadership or the synagogue authorities or the crowds, or the people, when the context itself would call for such pastoral substitution instead of using the words, the Jews. Think of this as remedial theological education for the faithful at all levels. Think of this as remedial education facilitated by the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education through conferences and seminars, virtual and in-person, by providing bulletin inserts for churches and short essays for and letters to the editor of Catholic and secular newspapers, and by posting comments and statements on the center's website and Facebook pages. I know it's tricky, and I know I shall be criticized for even suggesting this. But allow me to end by quoting from a book uh, some of you are reading and discussing at the present time. The Difficult Words of Jesus by Amy Jill Levine, and now I quote. With the rise of Jew hatred across the globe, with people who call themselves Christian shooting people in synagogues and Jewish community centers, 
and with children raised in Christian homes, finding neo-Nazi teachings compatible with what they heard about the Jews. In the Gospels, priests and pastors and Bible study leaders and youth ministers need to be increasingly discerning about what they teach and preach. End of quote. I think Eva Fleischner, our late loved friend and colleague, would agree with Amy Jill Levine's comments and perhaps even with my suggestions about remedial theological education when it comes to proclaiming the Christian scriptures during Lent, Holy Week, and in the weeks after Easter. If you take time to study, to read, and study, and discuss the memory of goodness, Eva Fleischner and her contribution to Holocaust studies, you will find ideas in it that will challenge you to find the courage to rescue the words of our Christian scriptures and to proclaim them in a pastorally sensitive manner when it comes to Judaism and the Jews, Jesus' own people and our elder brothers and sisters in the faith. Thank you. Well, Dr. Rittner, thank you very much, and thank you for that inspiring call to action at the end of your presentation as well. Uh, I'm Dr. Jim Paharik. I'm the director of our National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education. And of course, uh, part of our mission, in addition to Holocaust education, is fostering a deeper and more authentic understanding of Judaism among Christians. And so some of the work you referred to has begun, and it will continue. And I know you'll be by our side as we, as we uh, continue that work. Uh, Dr. Rittner is a member of our advisory board here at, at the center. And certainly your remarks were very apropos given that Holy Week is next week. And so um, as we hear some of those readings, the standard readings, uh, it's important to keep in mind what you just said that's very helpful. And certainly Eva's life and work were very much devoted uh, to not only um, figuring out ways to effectively teach the Shoah, but also to promote a better understanding uh, of Judaism among Christians. And so uh, reading her work uh, is part of our effort uh, in this direction. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Rittner and Dr. Roth for your work on this book. Uh, I'm also deeply grateful to the Fleischner family. You know, Eva was a founding member of our advisory board, and so our connection with the family goes back more than 30 years. Uh, we actually celebrate our 35th anniversary as a center this, this fall. And it's not just Eva, but we've met many other members of the Fleischner family as well. Uh, we're deeply grateful for the friendship of Eva's brother Hans and his wife Leslie. Uh, sadly, Hans uh, passed away recently and it's such a loss uh, to all of us. I wish he could have been here today. Uh, I miss him very much myself. I got to be very close with Hans, but fortunately, as, as Dr. Rittner mentioned, Hans and Leslie's son Christopher is with us today and Christopher's wife, Dawn. So, Chris, would you please come up and say a few words uh, to the audience? Hello, everybody. Uh, I don't have any prepared remarks, so I apologize if I ramble a little bit, but um, Definitely grateful to be here today representing the family. Um, my father did pass away in November, but if he'd been here, he would have loved the chance to meet all of you or see you again for those that he knew. And uh, he would have had some great stories to tell about his sister, Eva. Um, I'll try to share some if I can. Um, 
Eva or Eva, she would answer to either, but I certainly knew her as Aunt Eva, um, was just a very free spirit. She was somebody who I would visit in France when she was doing some of her research on Catholic rescuers, had a chance to visit her in Lyon, and she would take me around the town and introduce me to people, and she just had such a joy for life as she was explaining what she was doing. And she also loved to travel in the Southwest. She would uh, be teaching during the school year and then take time to go explore for a month at a time. She'd be camping out of her car, going through parts of the desert in the Southwest and really connecting with nature. And I, I feel like that's a really good lesson for all of us nowadays as we're so plugged into devices. If you're able to unplug and do some deep thinking, do journaling, get into nature and just reconnect with the beauty that's all around us, that's something that she just was part of her ethos right from the beginning. And uh, I think it helped inform some of her thinking as she would be by herself for long stretches of time. Thinking of her writing, thinking of the Bible, thinking of her friendships and how she wanted to stitch all that together. Um, trying to think what, uh, some other stories to share. She, uh, it was neat that she was a founding advisory board member of the National um, Catholic Center for Holocaust Education because that's when we would often see her. She was teaching at Montclair State but she'd be coming out to Pittsburgh in order to speak here at Seton Hill. And so that was often the times that I would be seeing her as she was coming or going. And I learned a ton from the book. So I want to thank you, Carol and John, because my wife and I have been reading this over the last couple of weeks. And I guess I knew her as an aunt, a family member, but I really didn't understand her scholarly impact and the way that, she, you know, what her writings were about and how she was thinking about it. So from the timeline to the essays and the articles, this has just been a great insight. And um, as Carol was mentioning, it is so timely. You know, even though these lessons were written, I mean, her articles were written 20, 30, sometimes 40 years ago, there's still relevance to today. So I would encourage each of you to please get a copy of the book and enjoy it because there's just some wonderful insights and relevance to where we are as a society today and to a remarkable person. I'm so grateful that Eva's legacy can continue with the National Center for uh, the Catholic Center for Holocaust Education here at Seton Hill, and that there will be forthcoming volumes, and that this is a chance to continue building bridges. She was all about building bridges between Christians and Jews, and this is such an important thing now more than ever. So, thank you all for coming today, and with that, I will turn it back over to Jim. Thank you. So thank you, Chris. And uh, uh, Chris was <laughs> very close to his Aunt Eva, and as you said, you knew her more as an aunt than a scholar, but uh, Chris, is, you are also an educator, and I like to think that in a way you're continuing Aunt Eva's legacy uh, by the work that you do. So uh, it's wonderful that this family tradition has continued. So um, Dr. Rittner will be happy to speak to any of you and to sign uh, copies of our book uh, after our program. But now it is my definite pleasure to introduce my colleague and supervisor, I guess I should say, uh, Dr. Deborah Fazer McMahon. Uh, Dr. McMahon has also recently published a book that she co edited, and it's a very exciting title. It's about women in science, uh, a laboratory of her own. Uh, it's called. And, you know, at Seton Hill, we have a long tradition of encouraging women to study science. Uh, my own daughter uh, has become a microbiologist, partly because of this history, this influence of Seton Hill on telling women that science, it's, it's very appropriate to become a scientist, a biologist, a chemist, and so forth. So uh, I'm excited to learn more about Dr. Fazer McMahon's book, along with all of you today. Um, Dr. Fasia McMahon is professor of Spanish, um, also the Dean of Humanities. And I have to say, not just because you're my supervisor, but I cannot imagine a better Dean. Uh, you do an incredible job in that work. Um, also, you have led a group of us in getting a very hard to obtain uh, grant from the National Endowment for Humanities, uh, which, we, which will allow us to teach educators from all over the country 
uh, grades six through 12 this summer uh, to teach them about, the genos about genocides and the Holocaust. So um, you've done that and somehow you find time to do scholarship as well. I don't know exactly how, but anyway, Deborah, thanks for being here today. So welcome. Thank you so much, Jim, uh, for that introduction. And it's such an honor to be included in this important event, this celebration of the life of Eva Fleischner and um, you know, this publication, The Memory of Goodness. I love that memory is in the title and I think that is um, a valuable connection point for my own scholarship. Um, I also love that uh, the focus in many of the comments today have been on um, Eva herself and her lifelong work and contributions um, as a female scholar, really trying to change the conversation within her field and make a difference and an impact in society. And also kind of the emphasis on um, the French women religious who um, were so actively engaged in um, trying to help during the Holocaust and really make a difference. And um, so my work and what I'm gonna be talking about today is also about interrogating history and culture and challenging us to think in new ways um, more deeply about some of the exclusions and um, the need for disruption in the way that we have thought historically. And the idea that words matter, I so appreciated that, uh, Dr. Rittner, and um, I especially resonate with my background in humanities and thinking about the way that we engage with words uh, is essential to be reflective about and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we might think about that in the connection of the humanities and the arts to the scientific realm. So uh, the, the book that just recently came out, um, it was a co-edited volume. I have two co-editors who sadly were not able to join me today. They're in different states and uh, different parts of the country. Um, but it really is focused on um, women in science but within the Spanish cultural context. We really started this project uh, around uh, 2016, which was um, the time when the United Nations uh, introduced their first International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And as Dr. Peharic mentioned, Seton Hill has such a strong tradition of um, encouraging women to pursue scientific fields. But worldwide, you know, this is still an ongoing challenge and certainly in the Spanish context is something that my colleagues and I were concerned about and paying attention to. In 2016, that was the same year uh, that Hidden Figures came out, the movie. I don't know how many of you might have seen that film, but I found it such a powerful story. And one of the things that really resonated with my co-editors and myself was this notion that um, we've sort of been uh, told or kind of have um, assumed through the cultural access we've had that women just weren't really involved in science. And in fact, that's just not the case. Women have been engaged in STEM fields. And so part of our work in this volume was recuperating that cultural history. Uh, because we study Spanish, and that's kind of our discipline in humanities, we wanted to look at this, um, you know, thinking outside the American context. And so it also just happened that in um, 2018, the major Spanish newspaper, El País, had come out with kind of a, a special edition focused on women in science, and not just within, you know, the Spanish-speaking world, but kind of globally, uh, but we were really interested to look within a particular cultural context and what that might look like and how it might differ from what we're seeing in the US and other parts of the world. Uh, the title of the book, A Laboratory of Her Own, um, really came out of uh, thinking through um, Virginia Woolf's influence within literary scholarship. So her groundbreaking um, long essay, A Room of One's Own, focused on the obstacles that women were seen towards engagement in a literary career and, you know, thinking what, what do women need to have access to in order to be able to write and publish? Um, and we wanted to extend that to think, you know, 
especially thinking about the 19th, 20th, and even um, 21st century right now, what is it that women need to really be able to engage deeply in STEM fields and in the scientific realm? Um, and what has been holding women back? Where have women actually been involved but not acknowledged or recognized? Um, and so we used Virginia Woolf as part of our inspiration. Uh, we also um, used a range of uh, feminist theories and uh, criticism as part of our work, uh, particularly um, thinking through Evelyn Fox Keller and her groundbreaking work interrogating the history of science and thinking through, even literally just two days ago, I was talking with one of my colleagues here on campus and they were, this is um, a faculty member who teaches in the natural and health sciences, and they were describing, um, you know, kind of a, a stance about what they teach is just facts. Like there isn't really discussion. There isn't like room for kind of dialogue. Like it's just, you know, these discrete facts that students need to learn. And I really, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the importance of data and data collection and um, fact-based discourse. We have you know, our truth-finding um, initiatives here on campus. And at the same time, I think we also have to acknowledge that um, science itself has a history and there are foundational assumptions and ideas that are determining the importance of different facts. And so I think the humanities is one of the areas that can help us to think through some of the exclusions that have come about because of that history. Uh, so the book was organized um, in three parts, much like uh, the collection that you heard about earlier. Uh, we looked at on role models, really trying to think about women scientists who have been actively engaged in um, the Spanish-speaking world, but unrecognized. We also, um, in the second part, look at STEAM, so thinking about integrating uh, the arts into scientific integrate. It, um, into scientific inquiry and the way that the arts might help us to further understand and better appreciate uh, the sciences as well as a range of other disciplines. And then finally, um, on gender, using STEM to critique uh, gendered norms. So um, this is kind of the, the first part of the book and I just wanted to mention uh, one of the things that we had the opportunity to do was to interview a range of contemporary women scientists um, in the Spanish-speaking world and to get a sense of their um, individual personal experiences and how they have uh, pursued their fields, particularly in the late 20th and early 21st century. And so, um, you know, as part of that effort uh, to bring the work of women scientists historically to the fore, we also wanted to talk with contemporary women in, in scientific fields. Uh, and so one of those scientists is Maria Jesus Santes Mases. Um, she holds an important faculty position at CSIC, which is the main um, scientific research institute in Spain. Um, she also, however, writes for the main newspaper, El País, and a large part of her work is trying to um, bring awareness to the roles that women have played in scientific endeavors. And um, particularly within Spain, thinking about how many exclusions there still are in the 21st century for women in science. So for example, at the university level, um, women professors in STEM fields are still um, severely underrepresented, even in contrast to other European countries. Um, so Spain's level of representation would be maybe 20% female in those fields. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, this isn't just a historical issue, but it's an ongoing challenge in many parts of the world. Uh, the second part um, really focused on the integration of the arts. One of the things that we found in Spanish contexts is that women had much more access to be able to participate in cultural realms such as, you know, through... Um, you know, writing novels or being an artist and painting or, um, you know, producing works that were kind of considered uh, something that women would be allowed to do or would be allowed to study. And so, so many of the women that we study in the collection um, use the artistic realm to engage their scientific interests. So, for example, um, one of the chapters that I contributed 
uh, is about um, one of the most important and famous contemporary poets in Spain. Her name is Clara Janés. And when I've interviewed her, one of the things she says over and over is, quería ser astrónoma, quería ser física. I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to be a physicist. That was my dream. But I was born in 1940, the first year of Franco's dictatorship. There were no options for me to study astronomy or to study physics. And I also loved literature. I became a poet. And so what Hanes did was she consistently integrated scientific disciplines into her poetic works. And so um, all of her works are imbued with theoretical physics, with astronomy, with all of these things that she longed to study and didn't have access to. Another way in which we see this um, are women who, for example, became very important, famous painters or artists. So here you have some images on the right-hand side of Remedios Baro, uh, who painted in the um, uh, early to mid part of the 20th century. And so many of her works um, really focus on um, providing images of women, or al although sometimes they're sort of genderless figures who are involved and engaged in scientific pursuits and experimenting and doing new things. Um, so you have, you know, interrogations of gravity, of botany, of all of these things. And so using um, aesthetic fields as a way to start discussions about the scientific realm. Um, another work that we look at in this section is um, called Maria Elena Ingeniero de Caminos. It's about a young woman um, right after the Spanish Civil War who is um, an engineer. She's somehow magically been able to go to engineering school, which at that time was not possible in Spain. Um, but this was also a period in Spanish history when because of the dictatorship, there was very heavy censorship of publications. And this somehow snuck through the censors, having um, a young female engineer who had been able to go to university. And what's really interesting, though, is in the novel itself, she is not able to practice or use her engineering skills in Spain. She actually has to travel to the colonies, so the Spanish colonies in Africa, to Equatorial Guinea, and in that context is able to use her gifts and her talents. Um, and so there's a lot of um, racial, in addition to gender dynamics, that come up in our collection and thinking about, you know, what does it say that in continental Europe this wasn't possible, but it was possible in other places, and the ways that we see that intersectionality, um, you know, of exclusions based on race and gender and class and, and other issues. Uh, the final part really uh, talks about um, using STEM and uh, a range of um, cultural productions to critique gendered roles. And in this section, um, we especially focus on film and photography, although also more traditional media. Um, but thinking about Spanish science fiction, I think is a really interesting place to see where this happens. You have a lot of contemporary films where um, it's actually quite rare to see women scientists, so they are not being represented in film, even though we certainly have more and more women in science and women scientists, but um, what you see more often is that women are represented as sort of guinea pigs, the, object, uh, the objects of experimentation, and thinking about what that means when you have this constant media representing women in a certain way, and then, you know, how does that impact how we perceive our futures or our possibilities? Um, and then also a, a range of um, photographic images from kind of the colonial period and thinking about how photography was used as a technology that um, interpreted and interpolated people and um, you know, set limitations about what might be possible for them, but also how those same groups, uh, particularly thinking about Equatorial Guinea, um, were able to uh, have agency by using photography themselves um, to represent themselves in, in ways that gave them um, access to opportunities, including in the scientific realm. 
So I just wanted to finish by talking a little bit about the process and timeline. I don't know how Carol feels about this, but I do think doing a co-edited collection has some really unique challenges. Um, one of the most rewarding parts for me was being able to work with colleagues as part of a team. And I so benefited from um, that experience. It also, however, um, you know, because there are so many different people in so many different parts, uh, it just um, takes much longer than you ever might expect. And uh, there were a lot of challenges. But I think um, individual ideas coming together really do create uh, the best outcomes. And um, I feel really proud of this endeavor, and it certainly wasn't my work alone. Um, and for any of you who are thinking about exploring whatever field you are in or whatever your interests are, um, I just encourage you to hold on to that vision. Um, a little bit like we talked about with Eva earlier um, this afternoon, um, really believing deeply in the power of what you're doing um, and trusting the process and, and moving forward through that. Uh, so I just wanted to end with, this is actually the epigraph that we used uh, to start off our work. Um, and we dedicated the book uh, to young women, y las chicas raras, the rare girls, or the weird girls everywhere, um, that they might be welcomed into and challenged by both the STEM fields and the arts. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Deborah. You know, whenever we can publish new research, those of us on the faculty, our center, it, it is indeed a cause for celebration. And so I, I'm happy that you are all here with us today to help us celebrate these two new books. Uh, please visit our author's table uh, to speak to uh, our authors a little more and maybe to get a signed copy or two. And also, don't forget that we have refreshments there, so no need to rush away. We can uh, have more conversation and, uh, and continue the celebration. So thank you all for being with us today.